Okay, first question here is, given the distance formula, what process would you have to use to find out whether an object is speeding up or slowing down at t equals 3? So the trick to doing this is to realize that you can determine if an object is speeding up or slowing down by comparing the velocity and the acceleration at that moment t equals 3. And basically, if the forces are working with one another, and i.e. going in the same direction, the object will be speeding up. If the forces are working against one another, one pushing in one direction, one pushing in the other, then the object is slowing down. So realize here that given the distance equation, I'm going to call it x of t. That's not a, a, it's not an uncommon notation. Sometimes they use y of t or d of t. So don't get stuck in the notation, but make sure you realize that it's a distance of formula or sometimes known as a position equation. Okay? And remember, I need to find the relationship between velocity and acceleration. So that means I need to know what the velocity of this equation is which, remember, is the derivative of the distance equation. So even though they didn't give it to me, I can find it by just deriving the distance equation. And I also need the acceleration, which means I need the second derivative of that same equation. Okay, so as long as I can derive twice, I should be able to come up with both the velocity and acceleration. But remember, I need to know what's happening at t equals 3. So I actually need to take 3 and plug it in to both those equations and compare their results. Okay, so I'm going to plug 3 into the equation, and into the velocity, into the acceleration, and compare the signs. If they both come out positive, in other words, both the acceleration and velocity come out positive, or they both come out negative, that will tell me that my object is speeding up because the forces are working with one another. However, if the, uh, it turns out when I plug in V of 3 and A of 3, the signs come out in op in opposite of one another. It means the forces are working one against one another. It means the object would be slowing down. And so this is the process to determine whether an object is speeding up. You've got to check both the acceleration and velocity and compare the signs. The signs are the same. Forces are working with one another, speeding up. Signs are different. Forces are working against one another, slowing down. Okay, the next part of this is to actually find the derivative of each of these of these equations. So what I could do is to actually try to solve these problems. Hit the pause button on your video and come up with an answer. And then hit play when you think you got an answer. And let's check it out and see how, you, how you're how you doing with this. Okay? So the first problem is to find the derivative of f of x. So I'm going to practice my notation, f prime of x. And this basically requires me to use the power rule several times for each term separately. So 4x squared, if I do the power rule, 4 times 2 is 8x to the first power. I'm not going to write the 1, but that's what it would be. When I do the second term, negative 2 times negative 3 is actually positive 6x. When I drop the exponent by 1, I get negative 4. For the third term, I again multiply the exponent times the number out front, so I get 1.4x. Got to be careful here, because when I subtract 1 from this, I get actually negative 0.3 power. And then plus 9, if I think of that as x to the 0, when I multiply the exponent by the number, I just get 0. So the derivative there would be 0. So that solves the first problem. Now I want to look at the second problem. g of x, which if I notice here, is a chain rule problem. I have an outside function, and I have an inside function. So every time I chain, do a chain rule, I always say the chain rule out loud. The derivative of the outside with respect to the in times the derivative of the in. So remember, the sine function was the outside function, so derivative of the outside would be cosine, with respect to the n would be 3x to the fifth, times the derivative of the n, so the derivative of 3x to the fifth becomes 15x to the fourth, and this would be my answer. Okay? Last problem here is another chain rule, just happens to not involve sine or cosine. So here I'm going to find h prime of x, and I'm going to realize that the 5 is my outside function, and the 3x plus 7 is my inside. Okay, so I'm going to derive the outside 5 times whatever is going to be on the inside to the 4th power. With respect to the n, tells me I leave the 3x plus 7 alone. And then I multiply by the derivative of the inside, and that would be times 3. The derivative of 3x plus 7 turns out to be set 3. And so there's a little bit of practice with the different rules that we've been learning. Okay, some more practice with some different types of derivatives. I see a limit problem, all kinds of different kind of, uh, of situations here. So let's take a look at the first one. So the first one says, find the derivative of f, given that f equals that equation that's given to me. So to find the derivative here, this is just the power rule here. 
But if you notice here, it's the middle term that's a little bit tricky. I think I can do the first and third term, but the middle term is going to take a little bit of work here. So remember, in an earlier video, I showed that a division problem is equivalent to a negative exponent. So we've got to think of this negative 3x to the 4th as being equivalent to negative 3x to the negative 4, so that we can apply the power rule. So we're thinking this in our head, even if we're not writing it down. So I'm going to derive that each one using the power rule. So the first term would be 6x squared. And unless this is the middle term, I would have a hard time deriving unless I use the negative exponent. So now it becomes positive 12x to the negative 5 plus 9x to the 0, so just plus 9. So once I remember that trick, it makes it a relatively easy derivative to find. Okay, so let's go to the cosine one, to the derivative of cosine of 2x. This is a chain rule. I have an outside function and an inside function. This is a relatively in um, easy chain rule problem, I think, because the derivative of cosine, we find out, is negative sine with respect to the n times the derivative of the n, so times 2. And so there's my answer. Okay, here's a limit problem. Okay, remember we always do substitution first, so if I substitute, I get 10 divided by 0. Hey, this isn't 0 divided by 0, so I can't factor, I can't simplify. In fact, this is one that mean, there is no answer. This is different than 0 divided by 0, which means there's an answer. I just got to look for a different process to find it. This one, there is no answer, so it's appropriate to say d and e, or if you recognize this as an asymptote, you could actually say infinity would be an acceptable answer also. Okay, the last problem here has that exponent on the inside. So remember, before you derive this, you should rewrite the problem with the exponent on the outside. So it would be sine 6x in parentheses to the third power. Now I can find y prime by recognizing my outside function and my inside function, which actually has an inside and outside function of its own. So a little bit tricky here. So I'm going to derive the outside. So that would be 3 times whatever is inside the parentheses to the second power. With respect to the n, means I'm going to leave the n alone. And then I'm going to derive it by the inside function. Or I'm sorry, multiply it by the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of a sine, remember, is cosine 6x times the derivative of that inside function times 6. And so there's my derivative of that fairly long, complicated chain rule problem. Okay, next thing we're going to look at is something called antiderivatives. And just by the name it means, oh, given the derivative, can you come up with the original function? So if you notice, every one of these, I'm given f prime of x. Or in this case, I'm given dy dx. Okay, so that tells me I'm given the derivative, I've got to find the original function. And they, if you notice here, they give me some extra information to deal with the, uh, an important fact that when we go to find the derivative that we need to be aware of. Okay, so we call these this extra little fact the initial condition. And we're going to use this as part of our process to find the antiderivative. So I'm going to start over again. Let's start with the first problem. f prime of x equals 2x plus 2 going through the point 1 comma 5. Okay? So what i got to do is figure out what function did I start with so that when I derive this, i got 2x plus 2. Well, remember, the power rule says that if you have a, a, a problem with an exponent, you multiply the number out front times that exponent, and then you drop the exponent by 1. Well, it makes sense that if I go backwards, i got to do that in backwards order. So given an equation that's an exponent already, and now I want to find the antiderivative, the first step would be to add 1 to the exponent, and then remember, instead of multiplying, I have to divide by that new exponent. So this is the ant what I call the anti-power rule. Okay, so I'm going to try that with this problem. The first one says it's 2x, and if I need to, 2x to the first power. So the first thing I do is add 1 to the exponent, so it'll be x squared. And then I'm going to divide by that new exponent. So the 2 divided by 2, x squared, is the first term, which actually will just be 1. But for right now, until I get the process done, I'm going to leave it that way. The next one is, if you remember, that's 2x to the 0 power. So if I add 1 to the exponent, I'm going to get x to the first, and I'm going to take the number out front and divide by the new exponent. Okay? But remember, this the problem with antiderivatives is that this no, it could have a number there. The equation could be anything, because any number, remember, is 0. So we represent the fact that we don't know what the number is by putting plus c, which is called a constant. That's why they use the c. I always joke around and say you can't go forget to the go to the ocean because you've got to add the C in there. So that's my little joke there. Okay? 
So if I simplify this equation, I realize, well, this is 1x squared, which is just x squared, plus 2x plus c. But notice I don't know what c is. Well, that's where this initial condition will help me find out what c is. Because I know that if I plug 5 into this equation and replace all the x's with 1, I should be able to figure out what c is. So I do a little algebra here. 1 squared plus 2 times 1, that's 3. 3 plus c is 5. Oh, that means c has to be 2. So my final equation for this one would be x squared plus 2x plus 2. That would be the antiderivative that gives me this function. Without this initial condition, then my answer would be this answer. Notice it has the plus c. Okay, so your answer will always have a plus c. It's just in the situation you have the initial condition that you can actually solve for c. Okay, let's try the second problem here. So the derivative is negative sine x plus cosine x. Well, from our trig, we realize all oh, the first function that I started with i going to start again here because I messed up my writing here. So the first function I must have started with, f of x. The, derivative, the function that gives me negative sine x is cosine x. And the derivative that gives me cosine must have been sine x. But again, remember, i got to add the plus c in there because it could be some constant at the end there. So if I replace all the x's with 0 and set it equal to 1, I'm going to 1 equals the cosine of 0, which is 1, plus the sine of 0, which is 0 plus c, and I realize, oh, c has to be 0. So my answer here for this problem is cosine x plus sine of x. That would be what we call the antiderivative. Okay, so let's take a look at some problems that are a little bit more complicated here. Because if you notice, you really have like an inside and an outside function. So this is what I call the anti-power rule. The anti-power rule says you have to anti-derive the outside function with respect to the in, divided by the derivative of the in. So notice it's very similar to the power of the chain rule, but then I anti-derive instead of derive, and I divide instead of multiply at the end. So again, anti-derive the outside with respect to the in, divided by the derivative of the inside. So in this case, I want to find out what y equals, which is the original function. So I realize x plus 3 is my inside. So I'm going to leave that alone. And I'm going to anti-derive the outside. So if I think of this as to the first power, I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, sort of like my anti-power rule that I showed earlier. So if I add 1 to the exponent, that'll be 2. And I'm going to divide by that new exponent. So for right now, I'll go slowly. 2 divided by 2. The number out there, I'm going to divide by 2. Divided by the derivative of the inside. Well, this one's nice because the derivative of the inside is actually 1. So I'm just going to divide by 1. So if I put that all together, 1, 2 divided by 2 is 1, it's x plus 3, whoops, squared, divided by 1, plus c. Can't forget to go to the ocean. There's my joke. So now here, notice, I have the initial condition 2, 25. So that means if I replace the x with 2, and I set it equal to 25, I should be able to solve for c. Well, if you notice, 2 plus 3 is 5 squared is 25 plus c means c has to be 0. So my final equation then would be x plus 3 squared plus c, I'm sorry, plus 0 would be equal to y. So obviously we wouldn't have to write that because plus 0 doesn't really change the equation. Okay? Okay, so let's take a little bit a little uh, problem a little bit more complicated here. This problem up here and we're going to find the um, where the derivative is this, we're going to find out what f of x equals. So once again, this is an anti-power rule because I can see an inside and an outside function. Okay? So the first step is to actually leave the inside alone and think of this as to the first power. So again, I anti-derive that. So I add 1 to the exponent, so this will be 2, and then I take the number that's out front and divide by that new exponent. So that's where the 4 divided by 2 comes from. But now I've got to watch out here. I've got to divide by the derivative of the inside. So in this case, I've got to divide by 2. Okay, which I actually don't like dividing by a number. It's a little bit easier to keep track of by multiplying by its reciprocal. So instead of dividing, even though I say dividing by 2, I'm going to write multiplying by 1 half. Okay? It's the same thing, but it's a little bit easier to deal with here. Okay? And then remember, we've got to go to the ocean plus C. So let's simplify this. 4 divided by 2 times one-half, actually comes out one, 
So I get 2x plus 3 squared plus c. Again, I can use my initial condition to find out what c is. I know that if I replace x with 1, and I set it equal to 27, I should be able to solve for c. So if I look here, 2 times 1 plus 3, that's 5. 5 squared is 25. 25 plus what is 27 means that c has to be 2. So my final equation then would be 2x plus 3, quantity squared, that's what I mean by parentheses, plus what I just found out to be the c would be plus 2. And that would be equal to f of x, the original function. Okay, one more problem and then we're done. Okay, so let's look at this one now. f prime of x equals 8 times 2x plus 3 to the third power. So once again, I'm going to try to find f of x by using the anti-power rule. Okay? So once again, if you remember, I leave the inside function alone, and then I look at the outside function. I add 1 to the exponent, so that's 4, and then I take the number out front and divide by that new exponent. But this time again, we have to divide by the derivative of the inside. So remember, even though I say dividing by 2, I write multiplying by 1 half. And then there's my joke, got to go to the ocean, plus c. So if I look at this, and that's kind of a long process, but if I look at this, I can simplify this. 8 divided by 4 is 2, times 1 half is 1. So I get 2x plus 3 to the fourth power plus c. And now I can use my initial condition to see if I can find out what c is. Okay? So again, this is f of x. So I'm going to set the equation equal to 85, and I'm going to replace the x with 0 and see if I can solve for c. Well, 2 times 0 plus 3, that's 3. 3 to the 4th is 81. 81 plus what number is 85? means c has to be 4. So my final equation then would be 2x plus 3 to the 4th power plus my constant, which turns out to be 4. This would be the antiderivative. Just want to note here that without this initial condition, if this was not here, that the best answer I would have come up with is this one right here. Yes, it has a plus C in it, but that's the best we can come up with. And even on the AP exam, they expect to see that plus C.